Welcome back. The great Sheffield cutlery industry has been decimated since the last war. Then it employed 30,000 people. Now it employs about 3,000. And cheaper imports from the Far East account for 90% of all stainless steel cutlery sold in the UK today. But some traditional cutlers, they call them little mesters, haven't disappeared yet. They still have their customers and their traditional ways. Grinders, buffers, polishers, hand raisers, silversmiths, paying the same attention to detail they did in the last century and working under much the same conditions. The last of the little mesters. This is dying out cookery trade. It's a shame for Sheffield because that's all Sheffield's known for, isn't it? Steel. And cookery. Oh, steel and It's actually a way of life coming down to work. What would you do if it didn't come to work except go around the hours and things, you know? I've worked hard. And uh, when I look back over the years, I have made out uh, out of it what I should have done for the effort I put in. You know, I've made scissors, but I haven't, uh, I haven't made money. See, things in those days, 1935, were like they are. These days, job's difficult to find. This scissor job was going, so of course, that's why I'm a scissor man. I went after it, got a job, and that's it. This courtyard, five or six years ago, is quite a busy place. All these shops that you can see here were all occupied. They're grinders, forgers, It wasn't the work, they've got old, and that's it. As you can see, it looks really derelict now, it makes you wonder what that's happened. It wasn't too easy to get to workshop in the past because there was that many little mesters out, that many men working for himself. I can remember a score of hardeners, both pen knife and uh, trade knife hardeners. I all used to work for the big forge and the firms. I can remember all this myself, but they've slowly gone. I tell you, I'm the last one. I'm the last little mester who hardens pen knife material, and that's it. Now, I've been a lucky man, me. My father was in this shop before me, a little mester. I came and joined him in 1947 after quite other forces. He taught me the technical side of it, the practical side of it, and I was taught the technical side by Catherine, which gives me the best of two worlds. But to still use the practical side, first of all, to see steel. Steel is a living thing. You can see it moving. You can see the surface moving. My, my grandson said he was going to come and learn the trade, but whether he does, I don't know. I am the last of the men who are the pen knife, and uh, I know about 80 to 90 percent of the pen knives in town. Mind you, steel today is not what it used to be. There's been a terrible decline in the industry, industry since I first started. Some of it is due to the failure of the people to modernise, like I had done. But some is due to the imports from the Middle East.
In olden days, uh, a little master, he'd, uh, he might have got, say, three or four or even more working for him. Uh, whereas I am, you know, I'm, I don't employ anybody. I just, you know, look after myself, like... You know, there's nobody coming into trade, but trouble is, while you're teaching them how to do it, it's costing you money. And it's what you're going to end up with, what counts like. I don't think them down south would work in these conditions. But then there again, up here, well, you know, it seems north can have all muck, we can have all smog, and now nice cushy jobs are coming with computers and all paraphernalia. They're doing them all down south, aren't they? There's firms like this all over Sheffield where every shop will be taken up by somebody either putting pocket knives together, uh, putting uh, plastic handles on uh, knives. Uh, there's Obsons, they are polishers. There's Kencroft. He's a hardener. He hardens uh, blades and that. There's Old Mother Stone upstairs. Uh, mirror polishers. They work for themselves. Me and Ed has been working here for 50 years. I used to work every weekend. I do now, sometimes, I'm a bit full with work. Keeps me fit. <laughs> Edna's 74 and I'm 76. This is what they call mirror polishing. See, what she does, that's the finishing. I do the uh, glazing and faulting. There was 17 when I came to do this job. But I've worked in quite a few firms. But uh, this is the only thing I like. I expect it's the only thing I can do. <laughs> Well, as for me, we started when we were about 16. We've been here 22 years. You see, we live quiet near, and it's handy just to come round and do a little bit and go home if you want. Oh, uh, we'd rather be on it. We've always been on us all, really. I mean, uh, when we worked at... There were only Worcester homes, weren't there, where we worked? Uh, yes. Mm, yeah. You might think we we'll... were... to ruin that shop. You might think we were well, lying, but it... we packed that job just in because... Just in case of idle people. They won't give us, they kept was. saying, what's the matter with you getting your money? I said to her, good God, this ain't going to last long. So we packed it in. We that place, a beautiful firm. Lovely firm, was to <laughs> No, a lot of firms are closed down. I mean, uh, we did used to do a lot for a chap called Barker. Well, since <coughs> far, missed, you know, father died, it's more or less, you know, they're just struggling on, I think. Well, there aren't many, is there? You know, you don't see many knocking about now, little shops. I mean, not mucky old like this, but still. Young ones won't have this. They look inside that door and they're off. Yeah. You know, if they brought anybody round to have a look like they've gone, no, they won't have this. My, you mean for what we earn? I don't think many would do it for what we earn, would they? No one. You see, when we've done paid for light and uh, power and materials, there's, not, there's very little. As I say, it helps for your pension and that's it. Not going to rot it now, are we? I said, we're not going to rot it now, are we? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you do it, Ethel? I mean, you're in here. I don't know. I, when I left school, I wanted to go on a machine. But <laughs> I had no idea what it were. <laughs> oh, mm. daft then. <laughs> It was just something you don't think about, isn't it, really? And when the teacher asked me what I wanted to work at, I said, on a machine. And that's how it is. I wish you were sure here now to tell her what to do. <laughs> I went into cutlery trade when I was about 14, like, you know, and uh, they were families of cutlers. In fact, 99% of the girls like me, when we left school and boys, they always went into the cutlery trade through relations. When you left school, your mum used to say, go see your auntie, go see your uncle. And uh, they used to find your jobs aren't firm, but 
managers, in, if you did anything wrong, they used to say, oh, your auntie's upstairs and your uncle's upstairs, and you used to get me threatened, like, you know. I've worked with Fred nearly all my life, but when he came on his own 22, 23 years ago, well, I came up with him, and I used to make knives up. But when he died, I hadn't the art to let anybody else have it. I couldn't let anybody else touch it. But it was a lovely trade, it was a friendly trade. It never earned a lot of money, but there was no one what would change it. I mean, in olden days, buffers in Sheffield used to go drinking at Monday dinner time. They didn't work after Monday dinner time. And, you know, they used to pack up at Monday and then the rest of the week they'd work. And that's where it fun work. And it's not the same. Not the same at all. The reason I took it up is because my, my grandma was a buffer and it was in the family. And I've been doing it now 30 years and I enjoy what I'm doing. And this is how it was done in the olden days, beyond. There were never no machines. And that's what spoiled it. The customers I do work for, they give me the price of their work. We can't say to them, well, we charge so much. Because then they say, well, we can go and get it done cheaper somewhere else. It's a cutthroat game. Everybody's undercutting one another. I still use some of the old methods, first of all, in hunting knife and boy knife work. I only use my pyrometry as a guideline. I still watch the steel. But the steel of today, in my opinion, is not as good as the steel of yesterday because they're mixing it too fast. I was told that uh, good steel, you can lighten it to coffee or stew. Longer the simmer, the better the taste. Okay. Yeah, that's that's it. It. That's right. There's that much skill done by the wayside. People come in, they've been to university, they don't know, well, the ground floor practice. That's what it's all about. There's a lot of very clever people on the ground floor, a lot. The Sheffield cutlery trade never ought to have gone to war because it was a case of property speculation. They thought the motorway was going through. So the uh, money people in London, they came to buy the Sheffield uh, cutlery firms up. And firms broke up like that. And when you break anything up like that, it never goes back together again. And all the quality stuff just disappears. You see, you've, in cutlery trade, everybody's got to have love at game. The money was never no incentive. It was never enough but they had the love of the game. You get a feeling that things is right and that things is wrong. You know, that the handle goes on right, the blade goes on right. If you haven't got that feeling, you don't make a good cutler. After making a pair of scissors, I get the satisfaction of seeing something well done. Not like lots of people, I mean, say you take a grinder, you never see the finished article. I do, I see it from uh, right from blank stage right to the wrapping up process. There's where your satisfaction comes in, you look at them, and they, they are too nice to sell them, of course. You have to be sold. I enjoy, I enjoy the job, what I do. You know, I can do it, I, I know what I'm doing, and uh, I've got job satisfaction. I know when I put, uh, if I grind a filleting knife, I know what chap who's going to use it, he's going to be able to do his job with it. This is what it's all about.
been here nine year now and I've managed to stick it out and I think I shall stick it out till till death. Yeah. That'll be it because my daughters don't want to come into it. They don't want to follow the mother's footsteps. <laughs> and that's it. I followed my grandma, but they don't want to follow me. So and on it way, that's it. They carried me out in the box up City Road. Oh, we're liable to pack it in any time, aren't we? She's not, she can't do it. I said, we're liable to pack it in any time. Oh, yes. <laughs> when we get a bit richer. When we get to be millionaires, probably. Probably be working another hundred years. <laughs> When I closed that door for the last time, I just don't know my feelings because I love me, John. I don't know whether it'll be sad. I don't know whether I shall say, thank God for that. That's the end of Kenny Croft. That's the end of an era. Almost an old master's setting for Sheffield's little mestres, doing things the way they always did. You may remember a first Tuesday film on the Abbeystead disaster, the explosion nearly four years ago now at the Lancashire Waterworks, killing 16 people from the village of St Michael's on Wire. The villagers were visiting the pumping station when a build-up of methane gas caused a massive underground explosion. I've been in the fire service 26 years, and I've never seen a situation as bad as this. And my heart bleeds for the people of St. Michael's who attended this function last night on a social basis, and many of them are with us today. A first Tuesday investigation in 1985 highlighted the victims' struggle for compensation. They hadn't been paid a penny. I believe, and I'm sure you do, that we've, we've suffered a grave injustice and up to this moment, there has been a far from sympathetic attitude being adopted by those who, uh, whom we believe to be at fault. The North West Water Authority said it wasn't their fault. So did the builders, and so did the designers, Binney and Partners of London. But now the Court of Appeal have pinned the blame on Binney and Partners. They were negligent in not foreseeing the danger of methane gas. For the bereaved and the injured, it's a major breakthrough in the struggle for compensation. But it's not over yet. Binney and partners are appealing to the House of Lords. And until then, the victims must continue their wait for compensation. We'll be keeping you in touch well, we'll with any developments in that story. But that's all we've time for this evening. Until next month, good night. <laughs>